Mark Letiri here. Welcome to Guitar.com Live. I want to thank the good people at Band Lab for putting this awesome panel together. I'm here with two incredible musicians, guitar players, and we're going to talk about session work, essentially what it is, how to get into it, and how to do it right. I have Angie Swan here and Carrie Marshall. Uh, just a brief introduction. Angie has played with Will I Am, Nicole Scherzinger. I hope I said her name right. I don't know. Boney James, Stevie Wonder, Cirque du Soleil, which I want to talk about. And are you currently with David Byrne on Broadway or is that? Uh, well, the, the Broadway show has been put on hold. We were Got actually it. supposed to start rehearsals again this week. So, okay. Oh, awesome. we're still, the gig's still on. Yeah. The gig is still a gig. All right, good. We still got the gigs. And uh, my good friend, Carrie Marshall, AKA Too Smooth from Atlanta. He's been with Jason Derulo, Chrisette Michelle, Lettucey, Ty Dolla Sign, and has his own online guitar school called Carrie's Camp, which you can check out on his YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Mark Letiri from Snarky Puppy done stuff with Kirk Franklin, David Crosby, Tori Kelly, uh, 50 Cent. I write my own music, which is weird, like sort of instrumental guitar noodling. Uh, but anyway, I we're here together because we've all have a, a wealth of experience doing recordings with people, um, both live and in the studio. And uh, I thought maybe we could just kind of talk about our experiences in that, maybe like how we got into it. Um, now that we're into it, what do we do with it? <laughs> How do you do it right? Um, so maybe I'll just kind of throw this out there. What makes a great studio player? What makes a great session session guitarist? What do you guys think? I would say versatility. Honestly, um, when you think about being a good session guitarist, number one, you want to have good tone. Um, be, you know, saying somebody that can have a good quick turnaround, you know, and then, um, somebody who's able to make adjustments because you never know, depending on if you're in the studio or what a producer wants, what they hear, having multiple, I think sometimes just depending on the session, having enough guitars that can kind of cover the spectrum of stuff that you need to do and having enough tones. I mean, there's a lot of producers that like you to have a lot of stuff. And then there's some producers that just want you to be really efficient, have a Swiss army knife that can knock stuff out. And you're really quick at like, okay, I want you to play this. Okay, make it sound like this. Give me some of this. And then, all right, thank you so much. And have a great day. You know what I mean? So just got to be really versatile and really be able to like make adjustments on the fly. Right. Angie, how how much studio work are you doing? Because this kind of ties into what Carrie was saying about like flexibility. How much are you doing in-house versus like at an actual studio? Like how much remote work are y'all doing? Uh, well, currently, it's it's been a lot of remote work, uh, you know, considering the days we're in now. Um, and it'll, yeah, it'll be, again, it's, it is about quick turnaround. Uh, like, I'll get a call on a Tuesday or something. It's like, hey, I need this track. Can you have it by Thursday? So it's just about being available, having, th having everything set up. Um, you know, for the most part, I was more of a touring musician. But even when I was on the road, I'd always have a portable rig mm. with me. Uh, which I thought was very important to have your interface and just be able to record on the fly. Um, I, I did Terry Lynn Carrington's album, uh, The Mosaic Project. did about five tracks on that album when I was out with Cirque du Soleil, just oh, in my wow. hotel room. Amazing. Knocked out, yeah, about five or six songs and it, you know, plugged in direct, didn't even go through amp and then did a lot of tweaking in like post-production. So yeah, yeah, it is just very important to be available. And again, I agree with the versatility part. That's kind of seems to be the trend nowadays. Um, you know, you talk to some of these older players who have been, you know, they were there during the kind of the golden years of the 70s, 80s, 90s, mm -hmm. maybe. And, and it doesn't even seem like records are made like that anymore. I mean, I, nah. I, think I would probably say 80% of the session work I do is from my home studio, mm -hmm. you yep. know, via an email. Um, <laughs> with varying degrees of direction. I don't know, maybe y'all exactly. can speak yeah. to that. But I'll, I would say more often than not, the instructions I'm given are do your thing and yeah. I, hey, hey, I, I, like I trust you. You know what to so, do. So, so yeah. with the, with the idea of like versatility, like, cause we are working remotely. How, what do you guys have any tips to sort of avoid the back and forth of like, Oh, now that you played this, I was actually mm -hmm. hearing this on this other section. Could you go back and, uh. Um, have you ever done, I guess maybe I'll say this now that we're in sort of the, the quarantine session years, uh, yeah. have you ever done any Skype sessions like, a like a live, you know, where they've got you on FaceTime and you're recording it? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a few. I, I, yeah. I just did one recently. I, I actually went to a studio in Brooklyn 
And the guy, the client I was working for was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So he's talking to the engineer who's relaying messages to me. We kind of had a little time delay and he would, you know, you know I'd be playing. He tried to talk while I was playing. So it, it would cut out everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I do like nowadays when clients say, oh, be, you know, be open with it. We're open to your ideas. But you also have to be careful not to go into that rabbit hole because I could keep coming up with ideas forever. So you need to right, limit. Sure. You have to have enough discipline to say, okay, this is good. Say this, this is what I can present. Here are some other options if interested. But you have to really keep yourself in check. Otherwise, you can go on forever throwing right. out ideas. And yeah. there's no shame in, in asking for specific instructions oh yeah exactly. Exactly. if if you're if hey, you know if you help. need a heavy distorted guitar on the chorus just tell me that i need to do that even yeah. though my instincts may tell me that i should do that mm -hmm. exactly you no know, that i think that's the hallmark of a great session player is that they're okay with taking direction it's kind of yeah weird. i mean i always or, tell the client to help me paint the picture that you want me to paint help, help I mean, me help you I, exactly because i had a lot of brushes so i don't know which one you want me to use so just really you know yeah. and i think that gives them a piece of mind too so they, they can know like listen i told them exactly what i want i feel more comfortable because they do get that vague oh just do your thing and okay <laughs> you know i do right. my thing and it's well that's not really what i was thinking i was thinking more of this so i'm just you know like yeah. you said asking more direction definitely takes mm -hmm. the guesswork out of it Sure. And, and, and it runs the fine line. If you, if you, if they give you too much freedom, it, you might come up with a melody that makes you more than just a session player, but like a yeah. writer, producer. So you got, there's a real fine line. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, give me some examples of what you want this to sound like. Yeah. How do you, Angie, you bring up an interesting point because there is sort of that gray area in session work um, where in a sense you are kind of composing stuff for this tune are you did you come up with a riff that all of a sudden has now become the the bed bedrock for the for the song do you kind of go into a session especially maybe if you're in the studio with an artist or a producer or or it's a band date with everyone's there kind of figuring stuff out how much of that is agreed upon ahead of time like okay mm -hmm. what are of all these ideas that we are working out which ones are going to get us credited perhaps beyond <laughs> right. just just the session we might be stepping in something at this point i don't know if we should change right. the, yeah that, that, the that's a but... whole new subject that's another 40 minutes <laughs> okay all right shoot well maybe we'll have to reschedule but um yeah i i guess it's sort of one of those things where if you can if it, it's interesting because you want to help the, the production of the tune but you also are just kind of there to be the plumber you know you're just sort of there to fix fix the leak not necessarily reinstall an entirely new sink that you designed right yeah. <laughs> right so. again that comes with the discipline of holding back like you can give right just you know again when you're a hired gun you're, you're giving what you're asked for you don't want to overstep your boundaries so it's again self-discipline like i want to help but also i know not to give too much awesome. so it's a, it's a balancing act excellent um so speaking of, so, so how, I guess, and y'all can just tell me, but what, how did you get into recording and, and what was your sort of like first experience, you know, mm -hmm. when the red light went on and you were like, uh, <laughs> what were the early, the early days of, of your recording session stuff like, uh oh, did we just lose Carrie? Oh, I think we lost them. He might come back. He didn't like okay. that question. <laughs> Maybe it was a day. It was, could have been a dark time for him. I don't know. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, shoot. Where did he go? Do you want me to answer that while he comes I, back in? Yeah, go ahead. And, and yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Well, uh, like my early days, I would probably say it was like back at Berkeley. You know, when I first got hip to like being able to record at home. I mean, I was using stuff like Reason, Cakewalk, Sonar. Oh man. Uh, Right on. Like, all, the yeah, whole, like, all of it. <laughs> I mean, or you even, no, no, let's go back even like, like four tracks. Like I think, yeah, my, my Berkeley audition tape was on a four track cassette tape, which was um, with, you know, my friend Ramarcus Jones on drums. Actually, uh, Tim Robbins Williams was oh, a cool. bass player. Right. Yeah. I miss, I miss, I miss yeah. my homie. But, um, yeah. Yeah. We went to, we went to middle school together. I'm sorry. went to high school together in Milwaukee and we were recording our audition tapes on this little cassette tape, mm -hmm. cassette player, and we'd play it back and it'd be down like a half step or slower. You know, it was kind of funny. 
like to hear stuff like that. But right. that was like my first recording experience, I'd say. Yeah. What was but, it like kind of the first time when you were in with a producer maybe and they were kind of doing their production thing and, and it was the real experience where you were like, you know, or maybe you were in a band date, there was a chart, there was all this kind of stuff like. It was overwhelming. First time I stepped in a studio, I was just like, damn, there are a lot of buttons. <laughs> you know, yeah. just like, I, I, I never thought, I never fathomed that I'd be able to understand what the hell was going on or to see like a huge studio downsized to home studio to mm -hmm. be able to bring that to the other environment. Um, I'd say the first time was probably recording studios at Berkeley. Okay. And then um, in 2002, I recorded with Cliff Magnus and Bob Clearmountain and uh, Steve right Kipner. On. I think there, I was signed to a band on Epic Records. So we were doing like, a, this is when you had development deals. Oh, Carrie's uh, back. Carrie's back. Hey. Hey, man. Hey, oh. I don't know what happened. I That's all right. Connect to my phone. It's so weird. All good. No, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's like, no, I was just saying the studio stuff. That was like, I think it was a blue, oh, it was called Blue Mountain, Blue Something Studio, Blue Bell Sound Studios, I think, in Carlisle, Massachusetts, around right 2002. So, yeah, I mean, again, like I said, it was intimidating at first to see this huge studio that I always see on television. And, but, you know, it's really cool to have options of amplifiers and different things to play out of. Right. And nowadays, like, you know, I play through the temper at home when I'm sure. recording, which, which is awesome. It's, again, technology's made yeah. it easier. So, I mean, that was my first experience, though, like the early 2000s. Cool. Um, Carrie, uh, Angie was just kind of talking about her first experience, like, in a recording studio getting, getting a session. And I want, you to, I want you to tell me yours, but then also kind of, like, maybe, and y'all can both talk about this, like, the networking aspect once you've sort of done the first thing how do you get on to the next thing? So my first session, I want to say it was like, a, it was a local thing in Birmingham. And um, it was one of these like older like studios where you go in and it was just like, um, somebody had seen me at a church and was just like, hey, we need somebody that can play on this particular record. And would you be down to do it? And I didn't even, you know, I didn't even know what the business aspect of it was. I was just excited somebody asked me to play on a record. Mm -hmm. So going there and actually hearing a metronome for the first time and having headphones on, I, I felt so overwhelmed. I felt like a fish out of water. I didn't know what that was because I'm so used to being in a church setting. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of hear somebody click things off or whatever. So had to really like, it was like on the job training where you had to like learn on the fly. And from there, I, I mean, I did well enough for, you know, you could see the potential, but I knew that I needed to really work at you know, understanding what it was like play with the metronome, understanding of having like your own home set up or put yourself in enough situations so that way you could be proficient at it. And then I think the thing for me, once I started to kind of get my feet wet, the networking aspect was I would even use like uh, social media at the time. I believe it was like even some stuff on YouTube or some stuff on like Facebook where I would like fake like I was recording a session, like with a metronome, I think I hope that up. It'd be like, oh, if you need some session work, hey, you can call me, I've got some good rates. But that was really just so I could get used to playing on somebody's record and kind of yeah. get my feet wet and know what that was. So, but yeah, I created fake scenarios so I could kind of get on. But then once that started happening, then it was just, it was word of mouth. Then it was like, oh, he can really play on these records, you know, because then you started to get kind of small placements with smaller venues and it's started to grow your craft with the bigger artist. Right. That's, a, yeah. I, that's the awesome hustle, dude. I like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretend like you're working all the time. People assume yeah, like, yeah. Somebody's, somebody's gonna come I here. like it. Yeah, that's why I just keep all this crap here. I don't actually use any of it. I just, so people assume that I'm busy playing guitar. Do, 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 the, do the guitars deflate once this is over? Yeah, exactly. It's let, just, let a, it's, well, Angie, it's a green screen. So once, you know, oh, nice, nice. yeah, there's just yeah, a big green see. curtain behind me. Um, I remember that. Yeah, I remember the first time I got in a studio and put headphones on and heard my guitar through headphones, and I was like, "Wow, I sound awful." <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're you're so used to just playing an amp on a stage or something or a garage or whatever it was, and and I think for me it was like getting used to, right, like the the metronome, getting used to oh, yeah. hearing yourself not in a band mix. You know, yeah, because um, yeah. it's kind of a different. It's totally different sonic awareness that you need to kind of have. So I, yeah, I remember doing my first sessions were usually like in the back of, of a friend's church. He had like a little oh, wow. recording studio back there and he would just make, mm -hmm. you know, gospel records and we would, you know, mic up a Fender amp with one mic in the room with us and just kind of hopefully turn yep. the monitors louder than the amp was, you know, and, <laughs> and, we could, and we, you know, I don't even, I think we were on like a little laptop with the, it was yeah. very, you know, very, 
very kind of DIY, which I'm grateful for because I did enough of that to when, you know, I got into the, uh, you know, big recording studio, it wasn't so daunting. Um, yeah. even, even still though, you know, it's like you're in these big rooms and, you know, you, you don't want to, you want to get it right the first or second or third time. <laughs> um, did, uh, what was I going to say? I, I know, I know we all have quite a bit of experience doing live performance, like as, as, as freelance players or, or session players on a live scale. How much of that did you guys, or, or have you seen it sort of turn into studio work with any of these artists? Do you, do you, are you playing on records with any of the people that you play live with or? I think for me, uh, so what, Oh, you can go ahead. Well, hold on a second. Carrie, you just got in here twice. Uh oh. Yeah. Wait a second. I have to kick one of you off. Okay. <laughs> He's back. All right. Uh, who was uh, Angie? Were you talking? Oh, oh sure, sure. I'll just okay. Answer cool. Them. Thanks. But, uh, uh, I'm like, I haven't recorded so much with a lot of the artists I've played live with. Um, you know, I'd like to collaborate in the future. I've definitely collaborated with a lot of the bandmates mm -hmm. in a lot of projects. Uh, even on the road, again, having a portable studio, you know, you work. You know, the band, last band I was in, or the most recent one, we have six drummers. They're like Brazilian wow. percussionists. So, you know, we could still we could still collaborate and do stuff. And everybody was making tracks, so we send them to each other. And so it's a lot of collaboration. Um, as for, like, the main artists, not so much. I mean, fingers crossed. I'd love mm -hmm. to do that in the future. But, um, yeah. yeah. What about you, Carrie? Yeah, so I think for me, like, what happened with some of the artists that I started working with, we started to develop, like, some cool concepts. And then later on, we would go back and revisit some of them. Some of them got placed, some of them didn't. But mm -hmm. I know initially I started to see like a lot of drummers that were doing, this, you know, a lot of tracks would push it to the artist and the artist would be like, okay, cool, let's develop it. So that's kind of what made me, because, you know, started thinking on that line of like, oh, I should definitely try to come up with my own concepts and push that idea. Because mm -hmm. initially I was just like, I just want to play guitar. I don't want to think about any production. I don't right. want to think about anything like that. But right. other musicians started to see them like, you know, slowly but surely, hey, I got this track. I think you should just check it out. And I was like, okay, well, I didn't know that we could actually do that. So right. let me go ahead yeah. and start to do that. You know, yeah, yeah. I thought that was kind of taboo. I didn't want to step on right. anybody's toes. I feel like I was trying to do, like, I hired you for one specific thing. This is not an opportunity for you to be like, check out my mixtape, so to speak. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So mm -hmm. and once I started to see that it was kind of like accepted and if you built that relationship, then it's, it's kind of okay. So I started to like develop different things and started to get like different ideas and work with artists after that. Cool. Yeah, it's an interesting, um, I know, in at least from what I've heard, in, in some scenes, there's sort of like the artist has their live band and then the artist has the studio people. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, there isn't so much crossover, but um, yeah, I guess it's kind of, it's an interesting thing, especially if you're pursuing a career doing this for a living. It's always yeah. good to have the studio chops and the live chops because you never know when you might get called to do both. Yeah, yeah. Very true. It's, it's good. It's good for production. I mean, like w when I produce, I it's it's kind of funny. Like for my own EP that I've been working on, I don't actually play that much guitar in it. I'm mm -hmm. programming mm -hmm. drums or playing keys or like I'll come up with a riff, but then some songs I'm like, oh shit, I forgot to put guitar in this song. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, awesome. I, kind of, I mean, I I, I, pr I prefer to be just musical and like like I'm like, oh, this instrument would sound better. Um, and again, with some artists I work with, yes, yeah, some are very separate from the band. Others like, hey, I'm interested in hearing what you're doing. Um, you know, for instance, David, he's very receptive. He likes to hear new stuff. He's like awesome. a sponge. So if it ever came to a point where I wanted to share something with them, I know he particularly would, would be open to that. So that's cool. That's, cool. that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, let's see. I don't remember what I wanted to ask. Oh, well, we can just get right down to it. Uh, we can talk about gear for a minute if you all want. Um, sure. But uh, okay, what are you bringing to a session? Because I know if we're doing it at our house, we got everything or yes. enough enough stuff maybe, right? But okay, you got a date, recording date. Say it's a pop artist, which means it mm. could go anywhere. Uh, what are you What are you bringing? I'm probably bringing a Les Paul, um, an acoustic, and potentially. Um, a telly just okay. so you know you know okay. a lot of pop gigs I've always played a lot of tellies on pop gigs but I know they like to have those beefier chords if you have to ever go to overdrive kind of deal so I feel mm -hmm. like a Les Paul can be really do, you know versatile and then like everybody loves acoustic guitar for some reason always have it as a potential <laughs> <laughs> backup just in case somebody's like oh I got 
because I want to do some acoustic on it. Right. Something, you know. I don't ever really try to bring it out initially, but, you know, I just have it just in case. Yeah. Well, if I have to play acoustic, no, I'm oh, just Oh, look at that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm bringing three guitars. I would okay. bring uh, first uh, the, 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 the from Dennis Fano, uh, the Novo guitar. Which awesome. is, this mm. has a uh, Lawler P45s. It's just like kind of like I, I've never been like a single coil player. I like the thicker sound. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like went up a notch, you know, when I, you know, like for, for instance, talking head stuff like the Adrian Ballou stuff. I, I liked more thick or David plays a strat, but I like the, I like this P45s or, and I bring my nags, which is um, humbuckers, yeah. but I can split the coil. So it's like, uh, you know, carry less instruments which i like right so, that's yeah. super busy. do you bring your um i guess amps do you use what's at the studio do you bring a kemper do you have like your favorite vintage fender tweed that you have to have everywhere you know what do you all do uh, just ask what they have in the studio because i mean i really don't yeah. want to kind of carry all that stuff right. and then right. yeah. a lot of times i find myself even if I just go direct, like whatever the engineer is going to like doctor up the sound anyway, because there's so many plugins now. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they, they can make stuff. So I just, I'm like, yo, if I can go direct, let's just go direct to keep people because I can go get in and out and I have to be there, like trying to carry all this stuff, spending right. so much time trying to set up. Right. And versus just doing yeah. the job. Right. I find generally if I'm, if I'm doing a band date or a date where there's mostly human played instruments, I'll try to mic an amp or a cabinet, mm. but if it's going to be stuff is more programmed, I'll usually bring a Kemper. Yeah. Um, Cause I feel like it kind of, when you're not pushing physical air, it yeah. doesn't need to necessarily like, you know, respond to quite the same to everything else. So I, I, I bring a Kemper all the time actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's super portable. I mean, they, they even have the smaller floor model as well. I think right. it just came out last year or this year. I get my years mixed up, but uh yeah, the Kempers, for, for that reason, I think it's really, um, I, I really appreciate it. I mean, I like to play live through an amp, but sure. the past year and a half, I've been playing through the Kemper li for live shows. But, um, I mean, it sounds great. I mean, there's, it's, it's a really great piece of equipment to have. Um, but just like Carrie, I like to ask the studio, I'm like, hey, what do you have there? What do you have? Because, you know, yep. you can work right. with that, too. And he's right about the plugins. You can definitely, you know, everything's been so downsized now, which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you uh, do y'all have like a, a a a board that you bring to all your sessions, or just like loose pedals, throw them in a bag, depending on maybe kind of what I'm going to need to do, or do you have like your mothership thing? Well, you... so for me, I have a main setup. So like, uh, depending on uh, usually if I know the artist and what kind of like spectrum they like, if I feel comfortable enough, I'll usually just bring the Boss ME80 that has enough stuff that I need to do in there. Really, what, I, what they're what they're asking me to do. Cool. You know, like they want me to solo. It's got a really, I found a really cool kind of like solo patch that I usually like one of my go-tos. And then I like to use the Helix. The Helix is really like, um, it's got enough sounds and I can configure the boards any way that I want to. So it's like having multiple pedal boards and really in one little configuration. Yeah. You know, back in the day, I used to take like this big spaceship and it was like super heavy. <laughs> but like I said, again, it's just like the cut, I'm trying to cut down on like setup time. Mm -hmm. like, All right, guitar player, are you almost ready? You're almost ready? And I'm like, nah, I'm just a oh, few yeah. minutes. Let me... And I'm like, I, I just don't like, you know, when, especially you're doing a session, somebody feels like they're waiting on you. I love yeah. to just be like, oh, right. I'm good. Like, you know, I'm ready to roll. You know what I mean? So I wanted to like, keep myself in that same situation. So I realized downsizing, like my equipment made it more functional. So I take the anxiety off of being like, oh, they're waiting on you. They're waiting on you. Let me hurry up. You know mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm a single pedal. I like single pedals because I like to tweak cool. out. See, that. in contrast to what you said, I mean, I don't like people waiting on me. So I'm all, I always watch to make sure they're doing something else. And while they're doing something else, I'm trying to set up real quickly. But yeah, my pedals, I'm always switching my boards out. Um, when it comes to studio stuff, yeah, I like to get an idea of what they're looking for ahead of time. But pretty, pretty basic setup. You know, I'll have a nice delay with the tap tempo, the, the wall overdrive. Um, you know, usually a lot of times I get asked to record clean so they can put stuff in later. Okay. Exactly. Yep. That so, seems to be a, a yeah. Um, that's the thing. A yeah. topic now. I, I, mm -hmm. I send DI tracks a lot, you know, just, yeah, yeah. to see if they are going to get reamped or whatever mm -hmm. it is. I always, I have a board that I keep 
um, that does, I just, it does generally everything I needed to do, but my Achilles heel is always forgetting to bring a wall. Oh, yeah. So I've just started leaving them in the trunk of my car. (laughs) So there's like three of them back there because it's always Mm. one of those things where it's like, yeah, I think we're going to need a wall track. And I'm just like, oh, because I don't (laughs) keep one on my board just because I I don't really use it, but it's always the pedal that they want when I don't bring it. So I just, I use leaving them in the car. Um, I want to talk about kind of more like a little bit more of the musical aspect of something like um, when you're, say you're doing a session. Well, let's say it's an overdub session. So it could be mm. here at your home studio or it could be in a, in a studio with the, with the producer and or artist. A lot of times we know the artist isn't even there, um, right. but it's just the producer and the engineer. Do y'all have like a, a method for like how you track a tune? Do you do like, okay, just let me hear it. Let me chart it out. Maybe there is a chart. Do you play down one pass? Do you go, let's do the chorus first with this sound? Like, do you like to piece your parts okay. together or do you like to kind of just read it down and see what happens? What are your, do you have any specific ideas on how you approach I mean, that? I like to, I like to piece down, which because you never know, depending on the producer and the engineer that you have working the session, I may feel more comfortable if I'm here, like I'll hear it down first. I'll be like, okay, cool. Kind of like, and I'll, I'll make like little notes just so I can kind of okay. know where the road kind of goes. But then I may be like, yo, let me take the chorus first because I feel stronger about the chorus than I do about the actual verse. Hmm. So let me dive into that first. So cool. let me like really work that first and kind of give myself some time to kind of like let my anxiety kind of be like, okay, let me think about what we want to do for the verse and then attack the verse. You know, so I feel like that way, approach it that way, it makes it a lot more simple for myself versus just trying to like, let me go and take it from the top all the way to the bottom, getting frustrated because something is not sounding or I'm not hmm. able to get something where I want to. And I can hear where I want to make that change and the producer can maybe start, kind of see the frustration. He's like, oh, no, that's cool. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I want to take another stab at it. You know what I mean? So just trying to understand how to make it a lot more simple for myself in order to the best product. Right, right. Yeah. You, you know, when, when I record at home, there tends to be a lot more profanity, and I'm, like, cussing at myself. <laughs> like, definitely, you know, versus, definitely. Yeah, but then I'm like, oh, gosh, I should have done this. I'm like, come on, come on. But usually I'll, if, I, if I'm in a room with people, I'd like to take, I like to take time. If, again, if they're doing something else, I'll go sit with headphones, chart it out the way I like it charted out. Even if they give me a chart, I like my little cheat sheet notes. And yeah, yeah, just same as Carrie, I like to move around depending on if you hear ideas in, in a certain section of the song mm-hmm. and you want to knock that out quickly. Um, but you know, sometimes at home, I mean, if it's an easy chart, you just, I just play it all the way through clean. It'll be a little rough, yep. but then I mm-hmm. come back to it and kind of polish it up and say, just to get yeah. the ideas out initially. Yeah. Um, and then when I'm working with a producer or engineer, you know, it's really more up to them. Again, hired gun. I can do it the way I want to do it, but you've hired me, right. so you tell me what to do. Right. It seems like when, when it's the overdub session vibe, it's, it's always kind of, you can kind of piece things together, get a sound right. for the chorus, do all the things we need to do on the chorus. So it's the big hooky part of the song. And then we can kind of, do things for the verse maybe a totally different sound on the bridge Mm -hmm. um i i miss doing like live band dates with more than one guitar player oh yeah because then you can just cut the tune from the top Mm -hmm. each person you and maybe there's two other guitarists they each have a a job a role your part they do and you play your part and done Mm -hmm. and you know i I guess they still make records that way it's been (laughs) It's been a minute since I've done one, but yeah, um, yeah. I guess that's sort of a. I know that's how they used to do it. I was listening to a podcast today. It was Questlove's podcast, and he was talking to Ray Parker Jr. And mm-hmm. Ray was saying that he was doing some very white session, and there were like four other guitar players like on the tune wow. or something, and they each just played like a little thing, and then that was the track, and they did it in like ten minutes or something. You know, <laughs> that's that's how you make the gumbo, just little pe- little ingredients, yeah. but then it all mm-hmm. works together. Right, which yeah. is I love that. yeah, which is you know, it's like we record at home so much that we are that gumbo. We have to do all the different all the things, part. and you know, some yeah. song that should maybe only take you you know, 40 minutes or whatever takes like four hours because you're just kind of like piecing everything together and changing this and changing that. And then it's like, man, if we were all just in a room together and there were two other guitar players, we could just get this. Knock it out. You you know, when I record sometimes, again, coming up with all these ideas, I'm thinking, again, I could keep throwing out these ideas, but how would this translate live? 
right. in, a, in a live setting. I'm like, I can come up with six guitar parts, but playing it live, you're not going to have six guitar players on stage. So again, that that's the whole limiting yourself saying, all right, like play a higher melody. One guitar is playing up higher, one's playing lower. And they kind of, you know, they complement each other, which right. is right. overplaying. Like I could, ju- I could do four, five, six parts, but right. just keep it two, three tops. Are you guys of the mind where, um, especially if you're doing a remote thing where now I try to do this, like sometimes give the artist or the producer options to where they could all work together or you Mm -hmm. can kind of pick and choose. Is that kind of your method for delivering tracks on a remote session? I've realized if if I can give more options, then that's less for them to hit me back and be like, yo, can you do this? Right. Yes. Give them enough textures. (laughs) to right. where it's just like you know I, I give them like and then i'll try to label like basic pass like mm-hmm, pass mm-hmm. a little bit more you know da, 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 da. you know i try to let them know like this is like an idea if you wanted to kind of chop up some melodies these are like some riff ideas that you can kind of sprinkle cool here and there mm-hmm. i kind of like paint the picture for them so it's like you have the whole palette now you really you know if you need to hit me about something specific it's less than like oh by the way can you go back and do this or can you do this because then it starts to get like kind of annoying after i'm like man i should have just did what i was thinking in the first time interesting yeah no that's true you give them more stuff to work with i just actually did a session yesterday and i did this chorus and i didn't know if they wanted like a real heavy chorus so i used like Mm -hmm. the humbuckers made a really thick sounding chorus section i labeled that i used this guitar uh, these voicings, like I make it because it's a piano player. So I was like, mm, I knew I could right. talk to him like that. I'm like, these are the voicings I use for this take of this chorus. And then I play the same chorus, different guitar, different voicings. So options one, two, three, and just kind of labeled everything. And again, that way they can't, you're right, they can't come back asking exactly. for more stuff. I even clean it up too. So I clean up all the buzz and everything. Oh, and, sure. Yeah. Which they, you know, they love versus go the extra mile and put in the, of course, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta have quality for the clients. They like this. Um, Definitely. when is the song done? Like, when are you, when are you like, okay, this is the it. Grammy. I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> when it wins a Grammy, uh, you know, you fit, you've tracked out everything you think. When are you like, when do you hit send on that email to send the, the reference bounce? Oof. I mean, usually like for me, like I'll, I'll sit with it and I'll listen to it a couple different times. And then like, as the rule of thumb, I usually have my wife come and just like listen to it. Cause she'll know she's not like a music person, but she'll be like, ah, something just doesn't feel right. And if it doesn't feel right to her, then I know I probably need to go back and fine tune something. If she's like kind of grooving a little bit mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, I feel like it's enough. It's good enough for me to send as a reference. Now, if they want to kind of doctor it up, then of course we can clean it up. But I, you know, right. she's usually my gauge. She's my go-to. So I got right. like, yeah, hey, come check this out real quick. Well, right. I just find a tender date each night to come over and listen to my tracks. <laughs> 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 amazing no 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 seriously i have no i i again it's again stopping yourself you know mm-hmm. like i usually go three takes i'll do three takes of something different and then say all right this is cool you know because i don't want to overwhelm the person with too much yeah i think three is like my golden number mm-hmm. and then i'll do like a fourth bonus track like i'll do what they ask me for but then the fourth one is like free for all right like just cool. gotcha. what, what what I would hear over that. Right. My thing, it's like, is it's, even when I get to a point where I think it's done, if there's something in the back of my head, that's like, they're probably going to want you to do that thing that you don't want to do, but you should just do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to, I just, I'll just go do it, yeah. <laughs> you know? And then, and then at least that way they've got, they've got the options there if they have it. Um, well, we're kind of wrapping up a little bit, but uh, any, um, any cool, like, session stories you guys might have like you know you were and it could be maybe not in a recording studio maybe just on a gig or something i mean uh you know i guess i actually angie i am kind of curious as to how the whole cirque du soleil thing goes if you don't mind maybe talking about that just Uh, whatever yeah yeah really uh, really quickly it was um you know we're all wireless we're running through palmers they had amps Mm. under the stage as well uh unlike david's show was all kemper wireless oh wow um so, because we, we would have to be on the stage sometimes when, when the acrobats were like flying over us. But what was weird was what was going on in our ears because the band leader is looking at three TV screens 
And so the music sometimes didn't go on a click. We had to follow the action. So mm -hmm. if, a, if, if an acrobat landed on an upbeat, the upbeat would automatically become the downbeat. So the music... So it was very, it's, it, it was- Are you reading crazy. too? Like, are you reading charts while this is going on? Uh, after a while, I memorized the whole score. Okay. So you, you're reading to a point, but then there were, there were some sections that said open, wait for cue. And there were, mm. there was a lot of that because it's a live show. Mm. So it, it was, you, you really had to know the songs well enough to not know them, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. you, you had to know the song, but then be completely present that at any moment, the song could change based on what was happening on stage. So you've got mm -hmm. people talking in your ears, you hear the stage manager, the music director, the click and everything else. So it, it was a lot, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a pre that's pressure, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. If, an, if, a, if, a, if a guy like lands on the trampoline like early, you gotta like play off of that? Yeah, like for instance, you'd be like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Mental that's, acrobatics. Mental yeah, acrobatics. That's wild. And did you um, what did they? How did they? And I guess this kind of ties into doing session work too. It's like, did you get the songs ahead of time, or was it all just like, here's the? Oh, uh, we we, we got chart, we got charts and reference tracks. So gotcha. we'd re we'd rehearse as a band in a studio. Then eventually the band would go into the room where the actual acrobatics were happening, like a gymnasium type thing. Cool. Mm. Um, and then then they go into then they built the tent, and then you know we're, we were on stage. There were two pits on stage. Um, so yeah, it was it was a strange process. They call it the creation period, but you know the music was kind of second to what was going on. Okay. So yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah. I mean, same with David's thing. Like we were, we were learning the choreography as well as the music simultaneously wow so like each note had a specific step so you're you're like dancing singing and playing so it, it was a lot <laughs> Jeez, multitask yeah so, and the chore the choreographer she'd be like throw your hands up on the downbeat i'm like there's no downbeat if our hands are in the air right <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like I, I I think I'm destined to stay in the studio or something because I could never do I can't dance and play guitar at the same time. I like, can't dance. I, I can only I can, if they called me for a gig like that, I'd be like, look, I'll just I'm just gonna do what I do. It's not gonna look right. like what everybody else does. No, <laughs> it's that, like hopeless. Well, I thought it was just gonna be like the two step, but we're like doing lunges. Oh and man. I canceled my gym membership. I'm like, I don't even need it right there now. There you go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Carrie, what about you, man? It looks like you're frozen in time here. But uh, can you hear me, dude? That's a good screenshot. I'm going to actually take this and send it to you. Oh, me. send it to me. I want to see that one. I can't see <laughs> For all the guitar.com viewers, you're watching me uh, totally shame Carrie Marshall right now by taking a screenshot. <laughs> no, it's coming back. Hold on. Here we go. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Carrie, are you with us? <laughs> Forgive hey, me. No, it's okay. No, Tell there's me bad weather here. So like, oh, like right. yeah. So like the weather is like going oh. right now. Oh man. You it's so cool cold screen. in Atlanta. It's the screen's freezing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got a cool studio story you can share with us? Um, I think probably for me was when I worked with uh, JC from NSYNC. I think nice. because the way that, the way that it had happened, it just happened from social media. So just realizing that like, you know, his management reached out to me and was like, would you be down to do a session with JC? And I was like, like JC, like NSYNC JC, like, are you serious? They're like, yeah. yeah. And so he just came by, we had a home studio set up and he came by and we did a, we wrote like four or five songs. And it was just like how down to earth he was, but it was just somebody that I looked up to as a kid, like, cool. you know, it was right here and like, you know, so it was just the fact that you feel comfortable enough in your craft that we are, you can be in the same room as somebody else without being like, Oh my God. You know I mean? I think that that was the coolest thing for me. That's that is awesome. man reached out to me on Instagram. was just like, Hey, would you be down to do a session? I was like, stop playing. Like, good. Let's get it going. Yeah. So that was cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I remember we snarky puppy was in the studio with the David Crosby doing some tracks for one of his records. Um, most recent one. And I just remember like, it was one of those things where the whole band was in the room and, and there was almost like too much information given by all the players because David is so, he just loves everything. Like he loves uh -huh. hearing everyone come up with a million ideas. And so Michael League, our producer, band leader was like, all right, we're gonna have to like put a stop to the ideas here because we're never gonna get this song done. But you know, it's like when you're in a studio with someone 
of you know like Crosby who has just done so much for rock and roll it's like you, right. know, you just want to get him as excited as you can um, but at the same time I'm thinking like I need to be a good band member and a good <laughs> job doer and just like do what I need to do and not what I think I should be doing and you know just kind of like putting putting the brakes on all the creative ideas just so we could get 17 guys in a room to play together you know yeah. um, but uh, well I mean I think that might be we kind of kind of wrapping it up here um real quick if y'all just want to like say where people can find you on social media or the interwebs or if you have a gig maybe uh that's if we're getting gigs again um What's so that? people can stay in touch you're right <laughs> hey we're, my, my trio is playing at a bar this friday well it's a socially distant masked restaurant so I can't really call it a bar, but but it's there. indoors. It's indoors, yeah. Oh, I mean, wow. I think they have the, you. they have the, uh, it's got like sort of a patio window thing that they can kind oh. of open up. But you cool, know, the cool. tables are all spread out, and they're, everyone's checking the temperature. So hopefully they'll do they're doing it right. Um, but uh, yeah. anyway, yeah, Angie, I know your what's your website, Instagram, all that good stuff. Uh, Instagram is at the Angie Swan. I don't put a lot of music videos up, but I will start to. I do. I talk about like politics and comedy and food. I'm like, right kind of all, all over the place with that. But um, uh, my buddy uh, JJ Appleton just he just got a pickup truck, and so mm. he's starting to put. We're putting like a little trio on the back of the truck and driving around New York. Nice. Just, right, oh, right now. You you can't advertise shows because they don't want people to congregate currently. Right. Yeah. So, so you're seeing a lot of portable bands in the city. So you mm. drive up restaurant play on the side of the truck. It'll have like your cash app or Venmo play a couple tunes and move on. But that that's his thing. And I might sit in with him in a week that's or so. Great. New but, Yorkers um, finding a way. Yeah, yeah. 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 And website, angieswan.com. I'm getting updates now because you know, I sw the Spike Lee, David Byrne film's coming out in a couple weeks. Awesome. Or uh, October 17th. And so I'm trying to get uh, my original music out around that same time. Cool. All right. I need to check yeah. that out for sure. Carrie, you're at what? Uh, my Instagram and most of my social media is at Carrie Too Smooth. It's K-E-R-R-Y, the number two, S-M-O-O-T-H. And then my website is Carrie's Camp com. That is camp with a K. So that's K-E-R-R-Y, K-E-M-P.com. Awesome. Uh, I'm at MarkLatiri.com, at MJ Latiri on Instagram, and I'm trying to be better about doing stuff on Facebook, but I can't seem, <laughs> I can't seem to beat the algorithm these days, so it's, you know, not getting the it's views. Beating it's beating us. It's beating us. Not getting the views we weren't were, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I thank you guys so much for doing this. Angie, Kerry, this was a lot of fun. I um, yeah, appreciate yeah. you taking the time. Thank you, uh, Guitar.com and BandLab for having us, and uh, for those of you watching, I really appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you around. Peace. Peace. Take care.